It's mid-December 1944 and Allied troops have crossed over into West Germany. In the East, most of the hard-won gains of the German army against the Soviet communists have been lost, and now a furiously vengeful Red Army bears down on Germany. The nation is facing war on two fronts and is losing on both counts. In his command headquarters, Hitler stews and fumes, blaming his generals, the troops, the equipment, everything and everyone but himself, despite the fact that he personally oversaw and planned many of the major offenses against the Allies. Hitler needs a miracle to save himself, and as he inspects the battle lines drawn out on a giant tactical map before him, he thinks he sees one. He stabs a finger down on the Arden Forest, disputed territory that lies between the German and Allied forces. His generals raise skeptical eyebrows. The forest is very difficult terrain for the mechanized armies of the Wehrmacht to cross. And yet, years before, at the glorious onset of what was at the time a highly successful and victorious war, they had done just that, completely taking the French and British by surprise and rendering the formidable French Maginot Line series of fortifications completely useless. It worked once, it'll work again, and despite the protests of his generals, Hitler orders the attack. His plan is simple, he'll surprise the Allied forces and split them in two by cutting through the Ardennes and deep into their lines. Once split, the Germans will hook north and seize Amsterdam and Antwerp, denying the Allies the use of their port facilities to land more troops and supplies closer to the front lines, and more importantly, keeping Allied air power at bay. In a stunningly bold masterstroke, Hitler planned to crush the Allied offensive on the Western Front and perhaps convince the demoralized Allies to join him in combating the Communists, who most of the world already held in deep suspicion. The plan was ambitious, and if it worked, it could have indeed set the Allies back months, giving Germany a chance to negotiate a ceasefire and push the Soviets back. Germany may not be able to retake the lost territories in France, but it could hold Poland and focus its efforts on the Soviet Union, at last crushing the Red Army and bringing Stalin to heel. It could work, and if it did, it would swing not just the course of the war, but history itself. Yet Hitler could never plan on the grit, resolve, and determination of America's 101st Airborne, who would hold against incredible odds and keep the Germans from securing their final victory. Working under a veil of extreme secrecy, the Germans began to organize for the pending attack under the codename of Operation Watch on the Rhine, a purposefully defensive-sounding name, which they hoped would fool Allied spies into believing the Germans were simply preparing for their defense of the Rhine River. Under the guise of defensive operations, the Germans gathered a force of 200,000 men, 1,000 tanks, 1,900 artillery pieces, all supported by 2,000 fighter aircraft. They would be facing off against 80,000 Allied troops with less than 250 pieces of armor and 400 artillery guns. Most of the troops directly in Hitler's way were American, and of them, the majority were still inexperienced, while the Germans fielded a great number of battle-hardened veterans, though they had supplemented their ranks with boys and men who would have previously been considered too young or too old for military service. The Germans would also be bringing to bear the mighty 70-ton Tiger II tanks, absolute monsters with no equal on the European battlefield. These tanks could score kills on Allied armor at incredible ranges and were so well protected that they could take several direct hits in return with little damage. In the air, the Germans also featured the new Messerschmitt Me-262 fighter jets, which dramatically outperformed any Allied fighter in the skies. Fortunately for the Allies, numbers of both Tiger II and Messerschmitts were limited, but where they were applied would dominate the battlefield. On December 16th, at 0530 hours, 1600 German artillery pieces opened fire, raining down destruction for an hour and a half across an 80-mile front opposite the 6th Panzer Army. The American forces weathering the storm believe this to be an expected and localized counterattack in response to their recent attack in the Wallerscheid sector in the north, where the US's 2nd Division had destroyed a large portion of the Germans' defensive Siegfried line. As heavy snowstorms blasted the area, both Allied and German aircraft were grounded, but the snow did not stop the rumbling advance of heavy German armor. In the center, the 5th Panzer Army attacked toward Baston and St. Fifth, critical road junctions that must be seized in order for the offensive to be successful. In the south, the 7th Army pushed into Luxembourg in order to secure the attack flanks versus Allied counterattacks. If the southern push failed, the flank of the German offensive 
would be exposed and vulnerable to counterattacks that could sever supply lines and isolate German forces in the same way they planned to do to the Americans and British. In the north, the 6th Panzer Army, best equipped of all German armies, cut straight toward its chief objective, Antwerp and its port facilities. It's the opening day of the assault and American forces have been taken completely by surprise. The initial push has seen major retreats by American infantry, but after the initial shock wears off, the Americans dig their heels in and repel the Germans. For their part, the Germans are now focusing their efforts on taking the critical Losheim Road, a route through the Losheim Gap which must be secured in order to transport the rest of the offensive to its ultimate objective in Antwerp. But American engineers have beaten the Germans to the punch and blown up two key overpasses, leaving the Germans with no option but to reroute their forces through the small village of Lanzarote. 22 Americans hold Lanzarote at the moment. 18 of them form an intelligence and reconnaissance platoon from the 99th Infantry Division, and four of them are forward air controllers, tasked with calling in air support where needed. This small village, normally relatively strategically unimportant, has suddenly become the most important objective in the German campaign, and this small force of 22 US soldiers is all that stands between Antwerp and the full might of the 6th Panzer Army. Early in the morning of the 16th, as the Germans launched their offensive, 55 soldiers from the 820th Tank Destroyer Battalion, help securing Lanzarote, are ordered to reinforce US troops in battle near Buchholz Station. Their withdrawal has left the 22 Americans alone and with no armor support. First Lieutenant Lyle Bauck, in command of the American defenders, orders three of his men to set up an observation post in the house on the east side of the village, and as he accompanies them he spots a column of 500 German soldiers advancing toward them. From their distinctive helmet style, Bauck immediately realizes that these soldiers are Fallschirmjäger some of the best soldiers in the German army. Most of his troops, meanwhile, are raw recruits with a few seasoned veterans amongst them. They are all expert marksmen, though, and in top physical condition, hand-picked for their assignment. They were supposed to be operating behind enemy lines, capturing enemy soldiers for intel, and fixing enemy positions. What they were not supposed to be doing was securing an entire village against a force 20 times their size. Bauk radios HQ for permission to organize a retreat in force, fighting a delaying action that would let his men retreat while putting up a fight that would slow the Germans down. The request is denied, however. The sudden offensive has taken the Americans by surprise, and the loss of the blown up overpasses has made Lanzarote critical to the German plans. It must be held at all costs. Bauk is promised reinforcements and told to hold. The Germans stroll into town with weapons slung, not expecting any American resistance in this sector, a fact that Bauk takes to full advantage as he organizes a brutal ambush on the unsuspecting Germans. The fighting quickly becomes house to house, and despite being hugely outnumbered, Bauk's men are scoring massive casualties on the Germans. The Germans may have brought their best, but the Americans are crack shots and have the advantage of being on the defensive. Still, the battle is clearly suicidal, and desperately Bauk calls for reinforcements and artillery support. He's told that none is available, and yet he must hold at all costs. This means hold until dead or captured, the village must not fall. With grim resolve, the Americans hold their ground, exacting a heavy toll on the advancing Germans. After 20 hours of constant fighting, the Americans are finally forced to surrender, but not before inflicting 92 casualties while suffering 15 of their own. Lieutenant Bauk is shipped off to a POW camp believing he has failed, and won't learn until the end of the war that his heroic stand was likely responsible for foiling the entire German northern advance. The 20-hour delay has halted the whole of the German 6th Army advance, creating a massive bottleneck that buys time for the American defenders to reorganize and counterattack. Improved weather opens up the skies for Allied aircraft, which savage German panzers, and the northern attack fails. While the advances in the north and the south were facing considerable resistance and slowly being ground to a halt, the advance in the center is a considerable success. The 5th Panzer Army, spearheaded by the 2nd Panzer Division, swings south of Bastogne and crosses the Orth River, though a lack of fuel briefly halts its advance. The Germans are cutting deep into the Allied lines, and back in Berlin there's much celebration. Despite the failures in the north and south, the Allies may still have their forces split, and if that happens, the Germans may be victorious yet. There's just one tiny problem, the town of Bastogne. A critical junction for the German advance is still being held by America's 101st Airborne. All seven roads that traverse the dense Ardennes forest converge on Bastogne, and if Antwerp and its harbor are going to be taken, Bastogne must fall first. 
Failing here means the Allies will be able to bring their air power closer to the front lines and begin landing troops and supplies close to the front. Bastogne has to fall, no matter the cost. In the small village, a few thousand American airborne troops are being supplemented by a small force of light and medium tanks and three artillery battalions. The American armor has taken a savage beating, and the remnants are organized into a mobile fire brigade of 40 tanks. The surviving artillery numbers at 36 guns, but ammunition is dangerously low. In command of the Americans is Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe. And having received the news that the Germans have pushed the Allies back on both his north and south, he knows that he's standing alone and reinforcements are coming. He also knows that if Bastogne falls, the German offensive through the Ardennes will break upon the retreating Allied forces with devastating results. The general assigns his men defensive positions to the east, north, and south, and orders the remaining tanks to form a mobile fire brigade responsible for responding to any armor spearheads by the Germans. At his disposal is the 36 artillery, but their ammo is running low, so its use will have to be sparing, and only when most needed. Needed. Most German tanks will have to be dealt with by the infantry, using their portable bazookas and grenades if need be. The worst winter storm in memory has struck the area as well, so resupply by air or tactical air support will not be available. The Americans are alone and facing a force of over 54,000 Germans. Early on the 20th of December, the Germans launched probing attacks against the encircled Americans against their southern and western defensive perimeters. The one advantage the Americans have is that being surrounded, the armor doesn't have to travel far to reposition against each German attack. When the infantry is in danger of being overrun by German tanks, the American armor disengages from one battle and rushes to the other. Their artillery is also able to rapidly retreat, and barrages of fire are brought down on each subsequent German attack. The Germans find no weak spots in the American defense and suffer serious casualties for the attempt. Still, the Americans are low on ammunition and the weather has kept resupply planes at bay. It's only a matter of time before they are annihilated. And on the 22nd, the German commander sends a letter to General McAuliffe. In it, he reminds the general that he is completely surrounded and that the fortune of war is changing. He informs the general that more German armor has already crossed the river outside Bastogne and is ready to join the fight. If he doesn't surrender his troops, they will be met with total annihilation. General McAuliffe carefully reads the letter, then picking up a blank sheet of paper, he scribbles a quick response before handing it to the German messenger. Back behind friendly lines, the messenger delivers the response to the German commander, who opens it to read, To the German commander, nuts, the American commander. On Christmas Day, the Germans make good on their threats and assault Bastogne in force. The night before, the Luftwaffe had carried out a bombing attack, which killed 21, but the Americans are still holding fast. The German commander concentrates his forces on one spot, rather than attack from all sides. And the 47th Panzer Corps smashes into the Americans on their western perimeter, rather than the south where expected. The initial fighting sees the Americans pushed back all the way to their command posts, but then they dig in and hold out against several infantry assaults. The panzers that formed the original assault split into two columns to encircle and try to reach the American command post from the rear, but they're met by the remaining American armor, and four tank destroyers are completely obliterated. The German assault has failed, and within days the Allies have regrouped from the massive German offensive and retaken the lost territory. The defenders out of Bastogne are relieved and hailed as heroes, but theirs is a story that has played out dozens of times across dozens of different flashpoints by the British and American soldiers who refused to yield under the weight of the crushing German advance. Peace at last is on the horizon, as well as the fall of one of the most murderous regimes of the 20th century. That's the story. Make sure you check out our other video, Battle of Thermopylae, Spartans vs Persians. See you next time.